Welcome to the Florida Bar Podcast, where we highlight the latest trends in law office and legal practice management to help you run your firm. Brought to you by the Florida Bar's Practice Resource Center. You're listening to Legal Talk Network. Hello and welcome to the Florida Bar Podcast, recorded for the 2019 Florida Bar Annual Convention of Boca Raton, Florida. This is Lawrence Coletti, and I'm the host for today's show. Stepping in, of course, as a substitute for Christine Bilbrey and Carla Eckhart. I will try to earn that role. And uh, joining me now, I have a return guest. I have the distinguishedly dapper, always Dennis DeVlemi. Welcome to the show, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. So you're a return guest. We've had you on before. I listened to one of my favorite parts of the Florida Bar Annual Convention, uh, having you on to do the uh, criminal law update. I love this series that the Florida Bar puts on it. So before we get to uh, your criminal law update, uh, let's, let's uh, for some of our listeners that are less familiar, tell us about yourself. Where do you work? What do you do? Okay. I've been practicing law for 47 years, Lawrence. I became a prosecutor in 1972 prosecuted in the uh, 6th Judicial Circuit of Florida, and uh, jumped the fence, became a criminal defense lawyer in 75, and I've had my own firm ever since. Excellent, excellent. So your presentation was impressive. You rattled through so many cases. It was actually difficult to find the ones, so many very interesting cases that were presented at the Supreme Court level here. So we highlighted a few, and I'd like to try to get through as many of these as we can in 15 minutes or so. So how does that sound? Let's go, rock and roll. All right, so let's uh, let's open up. There was one that was seven days old that you rolled into your uh, your presentation materials here. So it was Rahif v. United States, and this is the one where they added the Supreme Court added a knowledge that you're not supposed to have a firearm to a charge. Yeah, traditionally, uh, felon in possession of a firearm charge, all they had to establish was that the person. Uh, knowingly possessed a gun and that he was a felon, or he or she was a felon. And that was it. And then you could convict them and, and, and imprison them and so forth. Uh, it went up to the United States Supreme Court, and the question that they had was whether or not, along with knowing that you have a gun, whether or not you know you're of a class of people that are not allowed to have a gun. In other words, being a, a felon status, uh, you cannot uh, possess a firearm. Which surprised me, based upon the um, makeup of the Supreme Court, it was a 7-2 to two decision which also surprised me, because I would think, based upon the conservative nature of the court, they would say there's no problem in going after convicted felons uh, for possessing firearms. Okay, interesting case. Uh, next one up on the list, uh, Gamble versus United States. And so this was the separate sovereign doctrine. I've been reading about this in the news a lot. So can you give us the highlights for that one? Yeah, and as I said uh, in the presentation, the separate sovereign doctrine has been around for a long time. And I was almost surprised that the U.S. Supreme Court accepted this case because it's rather settled law. But they, I think they wanted to make sure that they were very clear on it. And what it means is simply this, that states and the federal government are two separate sovereigns. And it is permissible, the United States Supreme Court, for somebody to be prosecuted in one of those sovereigns and then prosecuted for the same offense and the same conduct in another sovereign. In other words, uh, you could be charged in Florida with, an, uh, with a crime, uh, you could be a convicted or acquitted, and then the government can, can pick it up. It happens a lot in, in um, drug cases, uh, because the government uh, wants to charge drug trafficking after somebody's been charged with drug possession. And they said it is permitted, it is permitted. They can under the separate zo sovereign doctrine. Now, where that might come up is, uh, and, and the discussion was, in President Trump, who has indicated that he might give somebody convicted of a felony and sentenced to prison in federal court, he might uh, pardon them. And if he, if he does pardon them, that, that means uh, they walk free. However, in the state where they were charged, if they pick it up, and I think this was the one they were thinking about was New York State, they could charge him in state court with the same offense, convict him, and sentence him and put him in prison, and the, uh, United, uh, and the president of the United States cannot pardon a state crime. Interesting. So uh, how far does the separate sovereign doctrine apply? I mean, if you have, let's say there's uh, two federal bodies, you know, like, I don't, and, and I don't know all the intricacies of how it would work, but there's an FBI bust, there's a DEA bust, you know, for the same, the same set of circumstances. Is there a chance for you know, preventing double jeopardy if uh, somebody gets acquitted at one? Well, and, that, and that's actually, that's a good point because the separate sovereign has to do with the state and the federal government being separate sovereigns. Each one of those is a sovereign. So in other words, you cannot have a trial in federal court, lose, and then have the, another federal uh, uh, prosecutor say, well, okay, now we're going to charge him with such and such. Nope, you got the same sovereign. It would only be if the state picked it up that they could go ahead with it. So that's a real demarking lie, state versus federal powers. 
That's right, exactly right. State versus, uh, versus federal powers, right. And you know, as I indicated before, uh, the primary example is in the Rodney King case back out in California. Uh, the officers were put on trial in state court, they were acquitted, and there was, there was such a demand for, quote, justice, that the feds picked it up, and they, they filed motions for, uh, to dismiss based upon double jeopardy. They said, wait a minute, we've already been on trial. And they said, nope, different sovereign, and they were convicted and uh, punished. All right, uh, Madison versus Alabama. So this was the Eighth Amendment case. The defendant, over time on death row, has uh, developed dementia. Yeah, this was a little bit surprising to me. Well, what happened was this particular um, defendant was on death row uh, for decades. And over that period of time, of course, you're in solitary confinement, he developed uh, dementia. And it got to the point where his lawyer says, he doesn't understand and remember anything that he did. He doesn't remember the murder. So how can you convict somebody and punish somebody if they don't know the facts of, of, of their case? They don't remember it because of dementia. Well, apparently the United States, the U.S. Supreme Court ended up saying uh, that if they understand uh, the reason that they are going to be killed, and that is that they did ca- kill somebody, the fact that they don't have a memory of the facts of the case will not bar conviction. So this is going to go forward to a death sentence. All right, so we'll change gears. We'll go into something a little bit more lighthearted. So uh, these versus Bartlett. And so this is the case where the police were breaking up a party and somebody got singled out because they were a little bit more mouthy to the police officers that were coming in to break up this party. I just thought, uh, like you, I was surprised this made it all the way up to the top. And so tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, th- this was uh, kind of an interesting and, and in, in a sense, a kind of a funny case. It was in a very, very, very small town. And um, the only thing you had to do in this small town was to drink alcohol and party. Well, they got rowdy and the police were called. Well, when the police came, they started talking to some of the partygoers. Well, Bartlett ended up going over and becoming uh, very mouthy because he was intoxicated. And he told the police that they have to leave. And then he looked at the people and said, you don't have to talk to the police. And the police looked at Bartlett and said, wait a minute, you're interfering with our investigation. Well, his mouth continued until such time as the cuffs came out. And they arrested Bartlett for obstructing and opposing uh, the police in the performance of their duties. So Bartlett gets taken off to the Huskow, uh, wakes up in the morning and and goes in front of the judge and the prosecutor stands up and says, judge, we're not going to go forward. It's a relatively minor uh, case. And um, so we're going to dismiss the charge against him. Well, with that dismissal, Bartlett, you ruined his party night and you ruined his night in the Huskow. So Bartlett decided to file a lawsuit. And he filed a lawsuit for wrongful arrest of the police officer to arrest him. He said, you had no probable cause. I have a First Amendment right to speak to you the, the way that I do. And um, it, it, for, like you say, it, for some strange reason, it made its way all the way to, to the Supreme Court. And it, and it did on the basis of a wrongful arrest lawsuit against the police. It wasn't a criminal case. It was a, a civil case. And what they basically said was, uh, as long as there's probable cause... If the police have probable cause and they arrest somebody, even though the charge is dismissed, they have immunity against being being sued. The exception, they said, is if the police single him out only because of his First Amendment right, when other people are doing the same thing but not mouthing off, then a lawsuit will proceed. Well, so strike one for the loud party goer. That's right. Yeah, the loud party goer needs (laughs) needs to shut up. (laughs) <laughs> All right, so Carpenter versus the United States. So this, I thought, was really interesting. So obviously, intersection of a lot of additional information because we've got cell phones on us constantly, information being bled out everywhere, our, uh, our location, our personal information. So this one involves cell phones in a car and third parties and what's admissible versus what is not. And so could you give us a little bit of a background on that? Well, yes. The U.S. Supreme Court has now ruled that an individual's cell phone is covered under the Fourth Amendment, which was originally drafted, that says that it protects a person's person and uh, papers and effects. Those are the actual three words, persons, papers, and effects. And although there were no cell phones back in the 1700s, they said what they really meant was anything that's personal to them that, that they would want protected, and it's protected. So... Your cell phone is protected in the sense that if they try to um, uh, access it, they will need a warrant to be able to, to go in and get it. The problem arises when they try to access 
a third party's uh, cell phone to look at it. Do you have a right of privacy in someone else's cell phone? And they said, no, you do not have a, a right of privacy in, in a third party cell phone because there's no expectation of privacy. So make sure you pick your friends wisely. That's right, yeah. And, and what you send them, pick, pick wisely too. Absolutely. All right, McCoy versus Louisiana. So this one uh, surprised me a little bit that this was even an issue. So this is the case where uh, there's a, a conceding defense over the defendant's wishes in terms of a plea. And so uh, can we get a little background on McCoy versus Louisiana? Yes, um, actually it wasn't a plea case, it was an actual trial case. Okay. And generally speaking, a lawyer has the ability to uh, make all decisions in a case. Uh, for example, if somebody wants an alibi defense, but the better defense is an identity defense, a lawyer can trump the client and say, no, we're not going with alibi. That's not going to fly. We're going to go with identity because nobody can pick you out or they picked out someone else or they described you six feet tall and you're really five feet tall or what have you. And, and, and the lawyer makes that decision. So the lawyer really has a, has a carte blanche in the decision and in, in basically the decisions of, of, the, of representation. The client, up until this case, trumped that in two areas. Number one, whether to accept a plea or not, uh, even though the client, uh, the lawyer may think he should, he can reject it, totally his decision, and also whether to testify or not. The, the, the lawyer can say, no, don't testify, and he can say, I'm going to testify. He trumps the lawyer. So what happened here was the evidence was overwhelming. So the lawyer went in and said, I'm going to tell the jury you did it, but I'm going to uh, base our defense on saving your life so that we get a life recommendation rather than death, because this is a horrendous case. The client ended up saying, no, you do not have my permission to do that. I want to take the stand. I'm going to say I wasn't there. Uh, even though the lawyer said, this is crazy, you're going to be convicted. So the lawyer did it anyway. The lawyer says, no, it doesn't come within the two areas. I make those decisions, and I'm going to concede uh, the guilt. The, he was convicted and sentenced, and what happened was the U.S. Supreme Court said a client does trump the lawyer in deciding whether or not to concede guilt of the crime or even a lesser included offense, a lesser charge, and that uh, without permission, the lawyer cannot do that. All right, Nelson v. Colorado. So this is the money back for vacated convictions. Yeah, this is uh, actually kind of a common sense case, if you ask me. That Nelson ended up being convicted his uh, case went up on appeal, it got reversed, it went back to the trial court and the prosecutor decided not to retry him, said, you know, you've been in jail long enough, we're not gonna retry it. So Nelson said, all right, I want my costs back. You know, I had to pay them, uh, you know, before the appeal and I won the appeal. And they said, no, 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 you had to pay it, you paid it, the money is ours. Went up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court said, no, 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 if it got reversed, anything that he paid into it, with the exception of legal, uh, legal fees, any court costs, transcript costs, things that, uh, and even restitution that he paid has to be returned. All right, so last case, Birchfield versus North Dakota. So this is the blood evidence in the Fourth Amendment case where breathalyzer okay, needing needles to get some blood samples, not okay case. Yeah, I, I included this one because uh, the ones that you just indicated were uh, 18 and, uh, 2018 and 19 cases, recent cases. The Birchfield case is a 2016 case. It's, it's not brand new, but it's so important that I decided to include it. And what Birchfield uh, versus North Dakota ruled was, it used to be that if you uh, were involved in a, in a crash and there was serious personal injury or death, the police could take your blood. And the, the grounds for that was, if we didn't take the blood and we waited, uh, you would sober up, it would dissipate, we wouldn't get a right reading, so therefore we're going to go ahead and take it. And the statutes around the United States said, no, we're going to take it because we need the evidence. And for so many years, up, up until uh, Birchfield, uh, that's exactly what happened. Went up to the United States Supreme Court and they said, you know, it's okay to take breath because it doesn't intrude into your body. It's not an intrusive violation. You stick a needle into somebody and you take blood out of them, that's intrusive enough, you need to ask a judge for permission. So they've now ruled that if, if there's a DUI manslaughter or serious personal injury, the police have to go and, and get a warrant. So what they're now is, I call them cookie cutter warrants, they're already prepared, they just fill in the blanks, and they, uh, they wake a judge up if it's three in the morning, the judge signs it, they come and they, they take the blood. 
There are some exceptions to that in very rural areas. If you don't have time and you can't find a judge and it takes too many hours to be able to, uh, to accomplish that, that they will accept exigent circumstances and still allow the blood to be um, entered. All right. Well, Dennis, thank you so much. I mean, we're coming to the end of our program, and I want to thank you again for joining us at another one of these uh, Florida Bar annual conventions. And so if our listeners, you know, they wish to follow up, learn more about what you talked about, how can they reach you? The best way to reach me, frankly, is my uh, email address, which is Dennis, D-E-N-I-S, only one N, D-E-N-I-S, at Vlaming, which is D-E, V as in Victor, L-A-M as in Mary, I-N-G dot com. It's my name. And uh, if you shoot me an email, put the Florida Bar so I don't delete it, be happy to answer their questions. Excellent. Well, that's all the time we have for this episode of the Florida Bar Podcast. I want to thank our listeners for tuning in. And if you like what you heard, please rate and review us in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or best yet, your favorite podcasting app. I'm Lawrence Coletti. Until next time, thank you for listening. Thanks for listening to the Florida Bar Podcast, brought to you by the Florida Bar's Practice Resource Center and produced by the broadcast professionals at Legal Talk Network. If you'd like more information about today's show, please visit LegalTalkNetwork.com. Subscribe via iTunes, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and RSS. Find the Florida Bar, Legal Fuel, the Florida Bar's Practice Resource Center, and Legal Talk Network on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Or download the free app from Legal Talk Network in Google Play and iTunes. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer.